we will uh, be starting very soon our second webinar uh, as a part of a series of webinars from uh, Info OB and uh, uh, with uh, jointly uh, with Bangladesh local chapter of Info OB. So today's speaker is Professor Wajid Hussain. Uh, he's a US scientist and world expert on authentic OBE. And uh, he has a vast uh, experience and expertise in wor working in the Silicon Valley, organizing a number of conferences, being a special uh, speaker in many uh, gatherings. And uh, he has uh, earned a lot of fame in, uh, uh, in, in the US and in the, in the Asian part uh, and the many other universities around the world. So let us welcome uh, Professor Wajid, and uh, who will be talking today on uh, quality and accreditation or OB, which one? So Professor Wajid, you please. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and good night. Uh, I guess I have to <laughs> announce all of these uh, time zones because we will have a multiple audience either now or watching the video later on. So uh, this is a very, uh, you can say, a curious topic. And uh, I had uh, our peer and mentor and guru, uh, Dr. William Paddy, point out to me that I should have made it more clear because he talks about quality or accreditation or OBE. Uh, in reality, uh, we cannot have uh, quality without OBE, but the the basic uh, nomenclature right now is, and the terminology is quality and accreditation go together. They basically club together. So there are marriage that's wanted or unwanted, but it's there. So that's why we have to put quality and accreditation on one side of the title and OB on the other. But it, this is a paradox title. It is a conflict in this. It's just trying to create a tension over here that we have to implement authentic OB, the paradigm principles of OB into accreditation to get quality. So with that said, let's get started. Uh, it is a dense topic. So uh, I hope I can do some justice to this. So let's start with uh, some basics over here. Uh, you see there's uh, a huge shift in global economies. And the definition of capital has changed from pure physical assets to estimation of its value using, I mean, uh, call is human capital. Now human capital can be, uh, you know, uh, talking about in terms of uh, health and skills to enhance individual and community life, productivity, earnings, all of that. There's a whole bunch of information provided by United Nations, World well, Economic Forum, UNESCO, by many, many other stakeholders on how the economies have basically changed and what impact they have on the globe, on our living, on the demographies, the populations that are moving you know, dramatically uh, and how uh, things are forming and they would look up into the future and they could impact our life, our work, our health, everything. So uh, if you look into this uh, provided by the International Labor Organization, you have uh, the evolution of worlds, uh, rural and uh, urban uh, population, 1990 to 2030. And then you see how the urban population is going to be, and is on the end, is going to be a significantly different by 2030. And then if you look on the right side, you see the evolution of the composition of global employment by main sectors. And you see how the services industry is going to overwhelm uh, the major proportion of, uh, uh, you could say, what our economy will look like in the years to come. So these are some really good resources with the International Labor Organization. I would encourage all of you to uh, look into that. 
So moving forward, let me just uh, show you some of these. These are some technologies that are likely to be adopted by 2025 provided by the World Economic Forum. And you see cloud computing, big data analytics, artificial intelligence, quantum computing, you know, whole set. So there's a whole change. There's a radical change in how employment is going to look like. So there's going to be skills and jobs that are going to be in you know, demand. And there's going to be the, uh, the others, on the other hand, are going to be lesser in demand. So all of this data is available. In fact, uh, the World Economic Forum provides, uh, the reports provide a huge amounts of data. They use LinkedIn, burn glass technologies, and they crunch all of that and give us a whole bunch of information. Now, I'm in, I'm in Saudi right now. I'm working here as a consultant and uh, uh, as a, a director of the accreditation work in the university here. So what, what we see over here is there's a bunch of emerging skills and then this rescaling and upscaling going on. And you can see all of those happening. So with that said, there's something brewing up. I would just point out to one research. It's uh, actually, it's an APL, APLU study by Crawford and Fink in 2020. And you're looking at, uh, look at the numbers here. There's uh, 2,743 employers, there's 4,800 alumni, 2,500 students, 1,300 faculty, about close to 12,000 uh, responses. And this survey was about uh, asking these stakeholders uh, regarding 11 skills. Now, these skills were both uh, technical skills and transversal skills. And clearly, their input showed something very, very important, which was, uh, uh, there was a clear lack of alignment in the priorities of what employers needed and what academic institutions were producing. So let me go to the, uh, the next slide. So this is the research. The blue is the employer. The red or maroon is the faculty. The green are the students. The blue is the alumni. So you have uh, workplace, understanding of the workplace and realistic career expectations. And you could see the employer, employer clearly says that there's a huge gap over here. The faculty are the least to accept that, uh, that fact, but the employers in the workforce and actually doing business, they could tell. So in the same way, alumni also clearly indicate the big gap. So looking at this data, we know that there is a job and skills mismatch. I have just produced one piece of uh, study and information, but in the in reality, I have come across scores and scores of uh, uh, work here uh, talking about you know the mismatch. So this is a, a UK consultancy back in 2018, but it's quite relevant. And what they're saying is looking down the road, uh, there is a risk for the growth of the gross domestic product, and which could amount to uh, several trillions of dollars, about they're saying $11.5 trillion. And why is that happening? Because of lack of capability for countries to supply the future skills that are needed. So this is all very alarming and uh, there's something actually that we have to do. Obviously there is a mismatch between education and industry or the world. So this is where quality improvement comes into picture. When we see why we may have this gap in education, why is there, uh, this void or why are there these loopholes and how can we overcome them? And if you look at quality, we look at the gurus, we have some, some of them, but they're the stalwarts, Edwards Deming, Joseph Joran, Phil Crosby. And then let's look at a very fundamental definition of quality. I'm actually uh, talking about this because 
we're going to look into quality and accreditation and OB, and we are going to try to integrate them together. And then we will try to see where we are lacking and what could we do to overcome that, to have a perfect causal link between quality, its principles, the frameworks of outcome-based education, and the results and student performance. So here we have Stout's view. It talks about uh, quality being an observation of performance compared with expectation. That's Stout's view, very simply put it. And if you look at quality management, it ensures an organization's product or service is consistent with its standards or par standards. So there are four main components, quality planning, quality control, quality assurance, and quality improvement. Quality management is focused not only on product and service, but also how to achieve that. So quality management, if we actually uh, look into that, there is some difference between quality assurance and quality control. And uh, quality management actually involves both of these components. And in the next slide, I will just go into some detail as to how uh, we can differentiate those both because that differentiation is, is uh, kind of crucial. Okay, so quality control is a process which entitles review of all the factors involved in production. The three aspects of controls, you know, the job management, process, uh, integrity and performance of criteria, and identification of records, then competence, knowledge, skills, experience, and qualifications, and soft elements such as personnel, integrity, confidence, organization, culture, team spirit, and the rest. Now, on the other hand, if you look at quality assurance, it's about preventing mistakes or defects in manufactured products or delivered services, avoiding problems. And it's, it's done in pre-production phase or pre-service phase. So uh, basically it connects with administrative and procedural activities that are implemented in a quality system. And that's how it is basically contrasted with quality control, which is more focused on the output. So it's a systematic measurement comparison with the standard monitoring of processes, a feedback loop, and then improvement. So let's look into uh, a very key concept of quality uh, brought by uh, Schubert and Deming. And, you know, Deming, Schubert, Duran uh, championed the quality work in Japan after the Second World War, that's after 1950. And he formulated a, about 14 points. And the two key points here, which I'd like to point out is to constantly improve and forever improve the system of production service and institute a vigorous program of education and self-improvement. I, I would say these are the two key concepts which you can take from uh, Deming Schubert. And uh, that's, the basis of the deming schubert quality cycle. Now, this quality cycle is not just uh, applied to the industry. I mean, like a manufacturing industry, but it's also applied very much in any walk of life, including education. So we're talking about uh, business processes or organizational processes being analyzed and measured to identify the sources of variation and that they don't deviate from customer requirements and standards. And then this uh, monitoring, planning, and corrections, all of that is basically in a continuous feedback loop, which is called the PDCA cycle. Now, uh, PDCA stands for plan, do, implementing the plan, checking, making assessments, and uh, acting on those uh, suggestions, recommendations for correction to improve the process. 
So this is the Deming Shu quite like this is very crucial for uh, the education process as well. And it is very heavily interlinked with, of course, outcome based education philosophy. So now if you look at the same uh, quality cycle being applied to education, uh, this is a very uh, kind of a generic model. But you see here, you have to specify standards. Standards are the key for programs, curriculum, for teaching, whatever those are, for performance. So you have to specify those standards. Then you have to implement them and assess how they're doing, assess any educational needs, gather feedback from the evaluation, direct and indirect, also from the stakeholders, and apply this feedback from direct and indirect assessment to improve education. So this is in, in a generic way, that's what quality is. And what stands out here is quality standards. I'm, I'm going to go into a little bit of detail on why quality standards are important for us and what relevance do they have with outcome-based education. So in higher education, we are pretty much uh, challenged by the uh, uh, need for identifying what those standards are. Yes. So let me just uh, forward this. Uh, just a second. So the term quality assurance in higher education, it's increasingly used to denote practices whereby academic standards, the level of academic achievement attained by higher education graduates are maintained and improved. So the definition of academic quality as equivalent to academic standards is consistent with the emerging focus in higher education policies on student learning outcomes. So in other words, uh, this is a, a research uh, article which was uh, quoted uh, quite enormously and it's uh, by Dill. And he's basically summed up the synopsis where we are talking about standards and standards in education are basically now student learning outcomes. That's the emerging focus. So let's uh, move forward and go into uh, those details. This is again uh, provided by uh, the International Labor Organization. And uh, you see here uh, a world map showing all of these countries. And now we see all of these countries and their national educational agencies are reviewing learning outcomes as measures of human capital. Remember, we talked about capital being physical assets, and then now they're basically uh, 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 not physical assets anymore. In fact, they're quite complex. And the thrust of the capital for any country is now human capital. So if you have a skill, uh, citizens, then uh, you have uh, a very uh, uh, high chance of uh, a bright and successful economy, uh, better jobs, uh, better conditions of living, health, environment, all of those just uh, fit in. So the point over here is that Formal education initially, uh, it was a metric for assessing human capital. And there were no actually standards for qualification. So now uh, those are actually being measured by educational outcomes. So that's the key thing over here. Uh, this is a International Labor Organization 2011 report. So 
we see over here that uh, national qualification frameworks since 1990s, there's been a great momentum. So uh, a major international effort in reforming national education and training through them. And a key notable fact was the shift to learning outcomes. And I've given a few references. There are hundreds of references which actually have gone over and I'm just uh, uh, placing a few citations here. Now, according to Coles 2007, to chart a course from a system with curricular assessment methods and qualifications that are based on inputs of content teacher time and non-reference assessments to a criterion reference system based on agreed learning outcomes. So uh, the same, we have some more references over here. The use of learning outcomes is established in emerging frameworks, response to the need to ensure coherence and overview, and that learning outcomes based level descriptors in comprehensive national qualification frameworks introduce common language across sectors of education and training, helping make the system more coherent and permeable. Now, the European qualification frameworks is based on learning outcomes for all types of qualifications, providing clarity, portability, and comparability of formal and informal learning across different countries and institutions. This is a, a UNESCO document 2019. Uh, it's a great document. It lists, about, I, I believe, more than 100 countries. And it talks about uh, an inventory of national qualification frameworks and uh, national policies, basically uh, uh, leading to uh, you know, the use of outcome-based educational models. This is a fantastic reference. This is another example how Singapore, if you look at uh, going from the 19, 1960s to now, it's shifted from low, uh, you can say, uh, technical, uh, skilled uh, manufacturing uh, scope uh, to uh, you know, a sustained economic competitiveness and national prosperity. And you can see that in the economic strategies and then if you look at the skills development strategies and initiatives, you can see there's a whole uh, difference in how uh, qualification systems are basically evolved now to deal with the emerging technologies and the emerging requirements of economies today. And they totally align with the UNESCO Sustainable and Development Goals. You have uh, the UNESCO goals here, cognitive learning objectives, social emotional learning objectives, behavioral learning objectives, and all of those, they're listing them as objectives, but actually these are, uh, you could say, the outcomes that we want education to integrate into. So you can see all of these changes happening globally, and that's quite interesting to note. And uh, you see uh, India, national education policy in 2020 they're talking about this the gap between the current state of learning outcomes and what is required must be bridged through undertaking major reforms that bring the highest quality equity and integrity into the system from early high early childhood care and education through higher education okay and they're saying the focus will be to have less emphasis on input and greater emphasis on output potential concerning desired, desired learning outcomes. So that's another example. If you look at uh, Saudi moving away from uh, oil resource economy to a knowledge-based economy. So you have the Saudi qualification framework in line with the 2030 vision and you have uh, an example over here of level seven of a qualification framework. Uh, it's based on uh, uh, level descriptors that are very much linked with outcome-based models of learning. So uh, this is a, a brief, uh, uh, you could say a snapshot of the Sw Saudi qualification framework. It shows about 10 levels, the 10 being the doctoral level, and these are again related to learning outcomes and their performance criteria.
Now, we talked about quality, some essential uh, concepts and definition of quality. And then we talked about uh, national qualification frameworks. National qualification frameworks are actually implemented by national qualification systems. National qualification systems in any country, they basically regulate education. These systems include the means for developing and implementing policy on qualifications, institutional arrangements, skills identification arrangements, and processes for assessment, awarding, and quality assurance. The European qualification framework is based on learning outcomes for all types of qualifications, providing clarity, portability, and comparability of formal and informal learning across different countries and institutions. There is an actual reason why I'm going through the qualification frameworks and the qualification systems because uh, they actually play a very key role in establishing quality in uh, national educational processes of any country. And this is the reason why. Now, if there are any inaccuracies, in developing essential frameworks of key educational interventions, the causal interconnections, their system-wide implementation process, evaluation of impact would prove ineffective in arresting the widening skills gap, resulting in significant losses ranging from several hundred billion to trillions of dollars worth of GDP growth for G20 economies in the upcoming decade. So you see, this is a very critical aspect here. And we're going to go into some details of these causal interconnections and factors. So we could try to see how we could actually bridge this gap, if there is any, and try to implement the right qualification frameworks through the proper causal agencies and achieve the emerging skills or the current required skills, knowledge, competencies we need today. So if you look into the key components of uh, any national qualification system, it's institutional infrastructure for governance, funding, operations, quality assurance. It's a theoretical framework for outcomes based learning. And it's a hierarchical structure of qualifications that define vertical progression within qualification systems. It's quality standards for development of curricula, internationally benchmarked quality assurance and CQI methodology systems and processes, accreditation agencies and components of the NQS, accredited programs providing credit and competency-based education, credit system that validate formal and informal education enable transfer of learning. So all of these are actual components of the NQS. Now, here is a, a a nice uh, uh, summary or overview of this uh, NQS quality, accreditation, uh, quality assurance of the education system. You see on the left-hand side, national qualification frameworks and some aspects of those. Uh, I will go into those with some uh, detail at a, at a later point. And then you have uh, quality control by accreditation you have institutions which are basically you know the byproduct of and and uh, the students the byproduct of the quality process and quality monitoring by national testing uh, i'm not going to go into the detailed factors for those but uh, i would basically uh, at some point of time uh, uh, talk about them in a little bit of detail Okay, so let us uh, proceed with national qualification frameworks. Uh, national qualification frameworks have some core elements, domains of learning, levels of learning, level descriptors, rules for classification of qualifications, rules for the volume of learning that contribute towards a qualification. And uh, before I get into more detail 
of uh, qualification frameworks, I'm going to go over some basics because when we examine qualification frameworks and try to find out uh, uh, how they relate to outcome-based education models, uh, we do need to go over a bit of a theory. And I'm going to go uh, a little faster over some of these aspects, but uh, you'll have to bear with me. Any questions? We will stop probably after another 20 minutes or so for a short break. And you could put in a couple of questions and then we'll continue because there's a bit of content that we'd like to cover. So we're, we're talking about John Carroll here. And John Carroll's work in 1960s, it revolutionized you know, learning. The concept of aptitude was revolutionized. So in, in, in a sum, you see aptitude of learning is, according to John Carroll, time spent by time needed. So time spent by students is the allocated time and opportunity given to them, the learning time. And then it's also their perseverance and engagement rate. If you look at the time needed by students, that depends on their ability to understand instruction and the strategy of teaching or learning. So that's basically the sum of Carroll's work and the academic achievement that he defined. I will go over a few points, then we will go into what outcome-based education is, and we touch a little bit on mastery learning. So in 1963, John, Carroll outlined the theoretical importance of time as a resource for student learning. Time is a resource. It's not, uh, you could say a base for student learning. Learning should not be based on time, but time is a resource. So he conceptualized the degree of student learning as a product of the time students spend learning and the time they need to learn, divided by the time they need to learn. The time students spend learning depends on the opportunity and the level of perseverance. Instruction time or the total number of allocated hours accounts for a major part of public spending on non tertiary education and constitutes a key resource that offers opportunity. This is a very key, key aspect. Now, if we do not understand that, we could design the whole national qualification frameworks wrongly and we could have faculty and students doing a whole bunch of different things. The time needed for students to learn depends on their aptitude, the quality of instruction they receive and the ability to understand instruction. So Carol's model basically says that if everything else is equal, if you increase the time the student invests in learning, it will lead to better academic performance. So that would be a key decision for policymakers, but you see the irony, uh, some major players uh, in the Asia Pacific region, without taking names, they've used student learning time as a base for computing student overload. So they have a diligent student and then they have a regular student. So it ranges from 40 hours to 55 hours and they start computing you know, the workload. But John Carr, what he says is, if there's more learning time, there's more learning. So they go contrary to that. And that's basically a part of the qualification framework and policy. And also it's part of all of their accreditation forms. So it's just a point that I'd like to mention. And as I go through my uh, uh, presentation today, I will touch over uh, several aspects uh, uh, maybe referring to different uh, samples all across the globe. And that would be important for us to take a note of. So if you look into Benjamin Bloom's mastery learning, which was called the school model of learning, it's actually an overflow from John Carroll's work. John Carroll said, aptitude is the rate of learning, not the ability to learn. This was the basis of Benjamin Bloom's model. And aptitude was traditionally defined as an intellectual trait, potential, capacity, and therefore the definition from Carroll was a radical one. So it suggested to Bloom that uh, if schools and institutions adopt consistent standards 
and systems that all students can learn, but the rate of their learning or mastery according to their aptitudes would be different. So it also allowed for uh, different amounts of time needed by various individuals in multiple domains. So another aspect was students should not be compared, but they should be given the opportunities to learn and attain their goals. So goal attainment rather than student comparison was the key important thing to learn from mastery learning. So you see how now traditional uh, uh, systems of education go very contrary to uh, the concept of mastery learning and Carol's uh, definition of aptitude. We are still quite entrenched in comparison standards. So uh, now a great change was happening back uh, a few decades ago in the US with 20 states following Oregon's competency-based education model. And uh, that's where uh, Dr. William Sperry comes in and uh, his work on outcome-based education uh, starts uh, playing uh, a dominant role in education, both in the US and internationally. So outcome-based education was first coined by Sperry and co-author Michel in a 1978 work called Organizational Context for Implementing Outcome-Based Education. So they were very keen on uh, developing uh, a holistic student rather than just disparate skills or technical competencies of uh, you know, competency-based education. So you're looking at other components like social responsibility, social integration, personal development, all of those had to be there for education to become successful. So now going further with uh, outcome-based education, uh, which meant that all schools, systems, programs, and processes were supposed to be based on outcomes. Uh, they had to be designed down from culminating outcomes. Expanded opportunities were supposed to be given to all learners. The SAGE on a stage, a unidirectional system of tutoring uh, was not preferred, rather it was instructional coaching. And then uh, uh, one key thing was uh, the, uh, you could say evolution of transformational OBE and which involved uh, exit outcomes that uh, dealt with the life performance roles like collaborative workers, quality producers, involved citizens, self-directed achievers, adaptable problem solvers. So, so transformational OBE was uh, the key aspect of uh, Dr. William Sperry's uh, outcome-based education uh, systemic view in which you have to prepare students for life performance roles, not based on time. And this is in his book, uh, Choosing Outcomes of Significance in 1994. So you have the OB timeline, school learning aptitude, John Carroll, 1963, uh, Bloom's learning mastery, learning for mastery, Benjamin, 1968, the traditional to transformational and now uh, uh, Bill Sperry had his webinar one and you all heard him and he's talking about various constellations and about the uh, evolution of learning. I'm going to go over a few uh, essential aspects of outcome-based education so we could actually look at uh, national qualification frameworks, uh, accreditation, national testing with uh, the lens of the paradigm and principles of OBE. So uh, the keys to having an OBE system are clear set of learning outcomes. All of the systems components should be focused on these learning outcomes. Establishing conditions and opportunities within a system that encourage all students to achieve those essential outcomes. The two purposes uh, underlying the success for all students and staff philosophy are, all students should be equipped with the knowledge, competence, and qualities needed to be successful after the existence 
the education. Now, the key word is all students. The, the key principle here is all students can learn, but not on the same day and not in the same way. And then structuring operating schools so that those outcomes can be achieved. So you see now I'm, I'm, I'm explaining to you about the need for a change in human capital, what's happened globally and the shifting economies. Then I went into some basic definitions of quality and quality standards being the focus because those were very key and those were not available actually uh, several decades ago. But now uh, learning outcomes, they form the critical and crucial standards with which education is uh, uh, accountable both to the public and to the students. And we can look into educational systems, pedagogy, testing, all of those through the lens of the outcomes-based model. But there are some key aspects of the outcomes-based model, which I'm going through now. So we could actually go ahead and look into the national qualification frameworks, accreditational models, and testing models under the premise of the national qualification systems. Are they in line with authentic and real OB? That's the real question here. So the three premises of the OB model, there's some key points here that I'd like you to remember that we speed up uh, a little bit more. All students can learn and succeed, but not in the same day, not in the same way. So they're all students. Successful learning promotes even more successful learning. So there has to be some networking of these outcomes. There has to be the hierarchy of these outcomes. Schools control the conditions that directly affect successful school learning. So coming to the principles, a clear picture of learning that students should exhibit in a performance. This is a very problematic area. In fact, uh, we will come to a part wherein the language of learning outcomes becomes very crucial. We all talk about outcomes, but, but when you look at the language, the clarity is not up to the mark. There's no alignment to the actual object of uh, demonstration. Demonstration is not observable from the language of outcomes. So uh, the outcomes are used mostly in the reverse engineering format, which we do at the end of the day, just before we get an accreditation visit. So I will go into those details uh, in the later half, but I would like to complete the theory in this first part of our webinar. So the outcome becomes the starting point for curriculum, instruction, assessment planning, implementation, and all of them should match. That is crucial. There's no surprises or shock treatment in education. Whatever you test is you have to educate students. You can't test them for something that you haven't educated them about. So uh, that's clarity of focus, expanded opportunity, time is a resource. You have to redefine and organize patterns of time. This is very different from the Carnegie credit hour and the base of the education model and systems today, wherein when the time runs out, uh, you lose all opportunity. So uh, methods and modalities, teaching and learning strategies, uh, varying teaching and learning strategies should be adopted now. We look at accreditation agencies and we don't see, uh, I don't see in most of the accreditation models today, a review of teaching and learning strategies. We don't see that. So that's something that we have to actually focus on as per OBE principles. Operational principles, teachers applying these principles consistently, systematically, creatively, and simultaneously in the classrooms. Performance standards, they should be they should not be comparative and competitive, uh, but they should be standards-based. Performance should be standards-based. So if there's an excellent or adequate or minimal unsatisfactory for level performance, uh, everybody could be excellent or everybody could be unsatisfactory, but there's nothing like a comparative standard in outcome-based models. Curriculum access and structuring. When you have structured outcomes, and you want to achieve mastery learning, you want to go from lower order skills to high order skills, you have to structure the curriculum accurately. You have to plug in the right kind of outcomes with the right level of skills in the right courses and develop the whole curriculum. No reverse engineering here. So unfortunately, 
many of us in many of the schools we adopt a reverse engineering policy when it comes to implementing outcomes into curriculum and it's 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 done very very rarely now high expectations uh clearly defining what acceptable performance is what the higher levels of performance is uh, rubrics play a very important role in this unfortunately when you look at rubrics they are very rarely utilized in many schools and uh, uh, they are so generic uh, the performance indicators or criteria are not listed to the level of the technical detail we need to assess especially when you go into very specializations of higher education that's a major problem design down uh, start at the end of learning experiences what you want students to be what are their main outcomes skills competencies and go back and plan out the whole curriculum we call it design down because of the design down mountain climber model when a mount when a climber climbs up a mountain he looks at the peak and then makes the path up from the peak all the way down so it's designed down uh, uh, because there's only as you keep going towards the peak the number of paths start reducing so the combinations permutations start really going down once you start reaching the top so the second rule of design down is uh, when you're going towards that path for that skill or competence or outcome you may face some challenges you may have to replace or eliminate parts of uh, content or change strategies so you'll have to be ready to do all of that so talking about uh, the fundamentals of obe uh, i will go into the three types of obe traditional obe transitional obe and transformational obe these have been the jargon of the day and we've had bunch of people asking us now what's transformational ob and how is it different from traditional ob now this table sums up uh, what the differences are in a very uh, you could say uh, uh, eagle view uh, way so it talks about traditional ob based on traditional approach of curriculum uh, transitional focusing on higher order competencies that reflect learners ability to do complex things with a broad range of ideas and information beyond conventional subject content transformational ob deals with context dominated context dominated outcomes of significance involving complex learning demonstrations that are essential to function effectively in occupational family civic recreational life performing roles so it's life performance roles are integrated with content and real life problems i will be talking about now strong focus on curricular content and micro skills like technical competencies very specific competencies in transition will be high order competencies uh, they go beyond subject skills such as uh, effective communi communication investigative research complex analysis critical thinking problem solving decision making and uh, for transformational these are abilities of significance requiring learners to integrate synthesize and apply a complex area of content and competence for demanding realities conditions and challenges encountered in job and community context and then if you look at traditional ob there's a minimal integration of high order skills that entail interaction with real world situations so uh, when you look at transformational Uh, you're looking at uh, that kind of an educational background which will help to fill up the existential gap between uh, a dynamic workplace and community needs and uh, uh, giving access to real uh, work environments or real work problems or life problems to students and making them uh, holistic learners uh, with uh, an integration of those life performance roles so that's basically looking to traditional and transformational ob a lot of curriculum and uh, education today has a uh, significant elements of uh, both the transitional and transformational 
aspects of OBE. And uh, I will later on go over the Washington export profiles and they talk about uh, various uh, elements of transformational OBE and real life, uh, uh, you know, environments and skills and uh, aptitudes that students have to develop. So uh, looking into Bloom's taxonomy, uh, that was back in 1956, Bloom came up with uh, the cognitive, uh, you know, learning levels, learned levels, and then with Crackwall and Mesia, uh, he came up with the affected domain. And then there are several models for the psychomotor domain as well. So uh, combining these three domains, uh, it provides a holistic version of education, a comprehensive version of education that we would like to uh, offer students. And that's a key aspect of transformational education uh, with OBE. So if you look into cognitive domain, uh, revised in 2001, it starts with remembering, understanding, applying, analyzing, evaluating, creating. So this is the learning progression. There is a learning progression in this. It's very generic and quite accepted worldwide. And then if you look into the affected domain, uh, we have over here five major uh, learning levels, starting with uh, receiving, responding, valuing, organizing, and internalizing values of, of forming a character. So this was also the 1973 model, but it doesn't uh, have to be this specific model. Uh, in fact, in this presentation, that's what we'll be talking about, that you're not obliged to follow any specific model. On the other hand, we would encourage uh, programs and institutions to basically uh, implement uh, learning levels and domains which are very relevant to their specialization, because some of these you may not even use. For example, receiving and responding may, may, may not be the target uh, you know, uh, level of learning in uh, civil engineering, for instance. Uh, more it would be valuing or organizing or uh, internalizing is, of course, uh, very vast, and uh, that's applied in almost all specializations. But receiving and responding uh, may be more applicable for uh, an aerospace, aerospace uh, engineering, uh, you know, aspect of specialization or people who want to go for deep sea diving or they have to respond to a bunch of sensory cues on time in a specific manner with certain skills. So you could look into receiving, responding. Uh, and the same goes for uh, the psychomotor domain, uh, which is the Simpsons model I'm looking at over here, having its seven levels. Uh, the reason why we have levels of learning and the three domains is without the levels of learning, learning without the domains, you actually cannot write outcomes because you don't know where to start writing outcomes. You don't know where is the starting point of learning or in this particular activity in a course module or topic, what kind of domain of learning are you looking into? What is the level of learning and what is the structure for the outcome that you're trying to write? So to get the learning progression, to attain the progression in learning, going from low levels of learning to higher levels, you need to have learning levels and you need to have the right learning domains. I'm going to point out to you uh, some issues with national qualification frameworks in which the learning domains uh, may not be appropriate and uh, they may not even have uh, uh, some kind of learning progression. So if you look here, uh, we're talking about these three learning domains of Bloom's taxonomical model. And we have these levels going from lower levels to higher levels. And you could arrange uh, learning in your course or your curriculum based on this kind of a map of how learning can proceed. But if you do not have this, then you don't have a learning model and you're trying to operate in a vacuum. I mean, in an ad hoc manner, which uh, will not be uh, very constructive and uh, uh, will lead to the, again, big gaps in what the world wants and what education is producing. So this is a snapshot of whatever happened in outcome-based education. 
uh, reiterating learning is not a simplistic process. It does not happen in a vacuum, cannot be achieved with an ad hoc arbitrary approach. Holistic education is a complex process involving development of uh, knowledge, of uh, identities and uh, behavior. Learning models are therefore necessary to inform effective education practice. Now, learning models represent complex educational processes in a simplified manner, creating a holistic view of teaching and learning. So uh, let's look into a few of these, and these are actually important because uh, they relate with how we can implement uh, you know, outcomes uh, in our educational processes and uh, how they are in fact connected with qualification frameworks, again, with accreditation policy and practice, and they're also connected with the national testing. So in sum, we have three major models, transmissive, unidirectional model, instructor, content, student, then you have a bidirectional, transactional model, you have the instructor, you have a student, you have a teaching learning transaction, then the factors that affect this transaction is the style of teaching, methods of teaching, assessment, and other factors of the environment and content. And if you look at Duncan Bill's transformational model, you have three stage variables, the teacher's formative experience, the teacher's training experience, the courses he taught, the years of teaching experience, the teaching skills, the motivation, personality traits, of the teacher, and then you have uh, pupil variables. The same would go for the social structure of pupils, uh, the class, age, gender, uh, attributes, knowledge, uh, abilities of students, and then other factors are school, community, context. So in the transformational model, the pupil's background also plays into uh, this whole, uh, uh, you know, educational process to produce that uh, product. And uh, in fact, the goals, the life performance aspects that uh, you know, pupils are supposed to have, uh, all of those factor in into the transformational model, which is the Duncan Biddle model, 1974. So in sum, we have a nice uh, uh, table here, talks about transmissive model, transactional model, transformational model, so just looking into the first column, the transmissive model, lectures, readings, guided problem solving, transactional model, student directed problem solving, collaboration, teamwork, and transformational uncertain and emotional events, reflection. So the primary outcomes, tools, models, strategies, methods for transactional skills and abilities, and for the transformational, its purposes, meanings, aims, goals. So uh, we have uh, a simple course module model of Gage and Berliner. You start an instructional sequence, before instruction decide on the outcomes of teaching. Now this is the process of how you actually implement the outcomes. A very simple process. Understand the characteristics of your students and before and during instruction, think about and use what you know about the learning process and how to motivate students instruction, choose and carry out the methods of teaching. Then after instruction, evaluate the instruction. And then based on the evaluation, you either improve that or you end the instructional sequence. Uh, the other model is a James uh, Grossier Martin, model. Uh, it is more than an hour uh, gone. So do you want to give me a break? Just give me five minutes, then uh, I will be done with the uh, models and then we will uh, give the break. Uh, just another five minutes. I'll be done with the learning models and then we will go into actual uh, e evaluation or review of uh, frameworks, accreditation aspects. Uh, let me just wrap this up uh, very quickly. Uh, if you look into James Grossier's model, you have seven interconnected variables and learning outcomes, they form the base. You have instructional processes, teacher variables, course content, learning context, learner variables, learning process. So there is a hierarchical structure of learning outcomes. 
aligned to program course and skill levels uh, and then uh, but there is a lack of specific and technical detail in this particular model so uh, if you look into a very uh, popular model is biggs and collins uh, it's called solo structure of observed learning outcomes so you have uh, basically five levels uh, the first level is pre structural level uh, does not have understanding uh, good understanding uses irrelevant information or misses the point altogether and then all the way i will not go into the details for that but it's something for you to refer but if you look at the fifth level extended abstract level uh, may generalize structure beyond what was given may perceive structure from many different perspectives and transfer ideas and then to new uh, aspects he or she may have the competence to generalize hypothesize criticize or theorize this is the solo model by bix and collins 1982 uh, but it focuses primarily on the cognitive domain now if you look into gloria rogers ebit model in this uh, it's a more comprehensive model it includes a uh, course evaluation as well as a, a program perspective you have a uh, program outcomes which you call the student outcomes you have program educational objectives which are linked to the mission of uh, the program and of course the institution as well then for measuring the program outcomes you have performance criteria the criteria are applied using strategies you have uh, assessment and then you have evaluation that feeds back to continuous improvement and there's of course the input from uh, stakeholders the key aspect of rogers model is a very involved continuous improvement process that on, not only links the course module Uh, but also involves uh, a systemic program level view of the whole education process so this is a, a process uh, from a bit accreditation uh, one thing i would say and close at this point is uh, the only difficulty in this particular process is the performance criteria are mostly generic so the program outcomes are linked to course outcomes are through generic performance criteria and uh, there's a whole uh, a lot of literature available talking about uh, the uh, lack of accuracy in assessment and alignment to actual you know uh, learning activities because of uh, being too generic and especially when you apply this to higher education specialization and you're looking at hundreds of skills it becomes uh, quite problematic so uh, this particular model was implemented uh, in 2017 and it's actually being followed in uh, several schools uh, uh, and there are multiple publications referring to this and implementing this in schools uh, uh, across uh, the globe uh, we're talking about specific performance indicators and uh, it's called descriptive rubrics or hybrid rubrics in which specific performance indicators they align accurately with course level actions now the performance indicator is basically in the hierarchy under the course outcome basically measures the course outcomes and uh, it is linked to the program outcome generic skills of program outcome so one of the issues here is the hierarchy and structure of outcomes if it is uh, uh, not designed to capture accurately activities at a course level it can result in uh, validity and reliability issues of assessment with this i would like to uh, uh, stop for a, uh, i think a few minutes of a break and then we would uh, uh, come back for some more uh, and uh, do to serve if there are any questions at this point we can collect them and uh, we will continue after a few minutes thank you uh, thank you uh, i think uh, the audience knows where to put the question answers uh, so, uh, the questions uh, yes we have got some questions so i think uh, you finish it up and then i will uh, take the questions to yeah. you 
if you have a few questions uh, i can actually uh, address them now uh, we will give them uh, maybe two to three minute break we'll address a few questions and then we will come back and continue uh, because uh, as i mentioned the content is uh, a little dense uh, in fact we look into frameworks first and then we look into practical uh, issues with uh, uh, you know the accreditation uh, systems and uh, uh, criteria so uh, i will uh, take a two or three minute break and the same for the audience and in the meanwhile you can just uh, arrange those questions we'll come back and look at them in a few minutes okay thank sure. you hello dr seva i am back okay thank you so you can uh, so i give you uh, two questions So one question is uh, Professor Dr. Bishujit Shah. Uh, he is asking that does standards of quality education based on numeric value? Please give an example. No, the standards of quality we are talking about are based on outcomes. Outcomes, however, as I mentioned, they have to be formulated with uh, several details the proper uh, hierarchical structure based on a proper learning model and then the right language the right assessment mechanisms rubrics the right uh, mechanisms to document them to uh, input them to quality processes and make the changes in quality basically to improve so if you have that, uh, then you have a, a real uh, uh, you know, quality improvement process based on standard. The standards in quality for education are uh, outcomes. These are the standards. That's basically what we've been talking about. What I'm explaining now in this whole uh, presentation is I go through all of those details. Then I go into, uh, you can say, some quantitative aspects of what are the problems in using outcomes where the problems come up even in numeric computations when you make evaluations yes you talk about numeric computations but uh, the numeric computations and values are not important if uh, the outcomes are not accurate the assessments are not accurate so uh, the the big problem that we are facing across the globe is these numbers uh, overall uh, are not making sense. They do not represent uh, skills. They are very composite. The sample sizes are not correct. The samples are not heterogeneous. And uh, they do not incorporate learning progression. You cannot really make sense of this data. So the data is there. It just fills up accreditation ledgers and shows that you're collecting it. But does it really make sense? Can you change education strategy? Can you actually get an improvement in student performance? I haven't seen such kind of data uh, very much. Uh, and so there are some problems which we're going to discuss in this presentation. Uh, is there another question? Yes, uh, there is another question. Uh, uh, same from Dr. Bishajit Shaha. The question is, uh, how standards of quality education justify the holistic development or evaluation of graduates? That's exactly what we're talking about, transformational OBE. When you talk about transformational OBE, you're talking yeah. about life performance roles. You're talking about uh, cognitive, psychomotor, affected domain. You're talking about learning progressions that basically encompass learning in all of these domains. You're talking about integrating them into curriculum properly. And when you do all of that, uh, that's when you can get holistic education. But uh, our focus, unfortunately, starts becoming just on the cognitive domain. And uh, that, too, if you look at uh, the nature of outcomes, uh, they're either stuck at a certain level of uh, the cognitive domain, like analysis or evaluate. We don't see a progression e either in the course level or at the program level. Even the sampling and uh, data collection that we do at a program level is so sporadic and spurious that 
uh, we cannot measure improvements of learning. We just take uh, a summative result so we can plug in the program level outcomes. So that really doesn't give to uh, all students can learn and succeed and doesn't support uh, that all students have all the information they need to understand their weaknesses and for remediation actions. So uh, I'm going to come into more specifics. I've talked about some frameworks and theories, but in the remainder of the webinar, I'm going to show you some tangible examples of where the problems lie. So, uh, uh, Professor Wazit, uh, there are uh, some few questions. Do you want to respond or you want to go ahead with the presentation? I think we can take one more question uh, and then I will go ahead because uh, some of the aspects in the presentation will uh, start explaining because I went through a whole bunch of theory now and now okay. I will be going into some practical things. We'll start making some sense to you know faculty okay. and, so, uh, and uh, it will be good. The, there is a big uh, bunch of questions from Dr. Engineer Shah Murtaza Rashid Al Masood. So I'm just asking you the questions, and I, I pretty well assume that the next subsequent lectures will cover all the uh, all these parts. But I'm just again uh, iterating the questions. The questions are: How do we align or map between quality in education, academic accreditation, and OB implementation in the teaching and learning process? And what are the main limitations of implementing OB properly around the globe? What yes. new assessment procedures should we follow to assess program outcomes effectively? How do indirect assessment method helps evaluating different outcomes? And what do you say? Would it not be more useful and fruitful if instead of assessing the PO as a whole, if we divide the PO statements into some meaningful sub-statements like PIs or performance indicators? <laughs> this is a whole bunch of questions. Uh, yes, no, no, these are all very relevant and all of them are going to be covered. In fact, some of the questions have already answered them. Yeah. Uh, I've just talked about models so far, but even the models I've talked about, they have wealth of information in them. Uh, this point which uh, the professor mentioned that can program outcomes be subdivided. So that's the way that accreditation agencies do this is basically they use, uh, you know, uh, the outcomes are structured into culminating outcomes or they are uh, structured into discrete outcomes or uh, they are structured into the course level outcomes. The discrete outcomes could be the performance indicators now. Now, uh, regarding uh, the discrete outcomes or the performance indicators, they could be either specific or generic. The model that we implemented in our school is we use specific performance indicators because generic performance indicators are too generic. And there's been tons of papers written on this uh, talking about when you have too generic of an outcome statement, the application of that, you cannot get a technical accuracy. For instance, you're trying to do a problem with electromagnetic uh, theory or digital logic circuits. I'm from an engineering background, so I can tell you that a general problem solving indicator, like selecting the right process of solution, you cannot apply it to both because both of them require different kinds of knowledge and different kinds of skill. So a success in either one of these doesn't substantiate a success in the another. So you need to have specific performance indicators that feed into the program level outcome. And that's one of the prominent errors of accreditation agency models is they try to simplify accreditation because they know that if you go to the specific performance indicators, you're talking about at least 300 to 400 skills that you'll have to measure. And then aggregating that, all that happening on paper and manually is impossible. So you have to go to technology. In fact, if you want to implement OBE properly, you have to have technology. You cannot do it without technology. It's just like uh, a medical examination and they're looking into a whole bunch of parameters in your blood. You cannot keep documenting that on paper. And even to study these, you could get that done through a lot of uh, digital tools that are available that can help diagnose problems by looking at a whole bunch of data. 
and I was in the Silicon Valley doing uh, wafer testing. So we were testing thousands of tests and we look at a wafer map, we look at, uh, you know, we use data power. So data, big data is the future. So in the same way, when you come to outcomes and skills, you have to structure it, disintegrate that and get the accuracy to get improvement. If you don't have that structure, you don't have the technical accuracy, you don't have the specificity, then you don't get it. And, and that, that's basically why uh, if, you, if you look over here, this particular screen talks about the solution. So uh, if you look into this uh, blue part here, which is the student cross outcome, uh, which is under the uh, program outcome, uh, you see, and the performance indicator is under that, but most of the accreditation agencies, they put the dark green performance indicator under the program outcome. So when you put it under the program outcome, it becomes very generic, but when you take it under the course outcome, you can go outcome by outcome, topic by topic, and target those specific uh, you know, demonstrations of student learning. But if you use technology, you can track them. And if you use embedded assessments, if you don't use technology on paper, you cannot do these things. So on paper, you're going to fake yourself and whatever you measure cannot be trackable, cannot be recorded properly. So that's why accreditation agencies basically tell you to do that because uh, about 95% of the schools, they're doing paper-based or they're using Excel and they cannot track that. So uh, Dr. Silva, I'm going to uh, move forward. And as I go, many, many things will surface uh, because I just discussed the initial theory, which is the heavy part of the presentation. I know it was difficult. It was difficult for me too. But as we go, some practical aspects will uh, you know, come into play. Uh, this this is also this is also an answer. This slide is an answer to their question. How do you apply this? You see here we have introductory courses, 200, 100 level courses. We have reinforced courses, 300 level courses, and you have mastery level courses, 400 level courses. So we got one curriculum. I don't want to mention the name of the country, but we bought a curriculum from a famous school and we applied it in our school and program. When we did that, when we look at the syllabus, you know, guess what? Everything was analyzed, analyzed, analyzed. So when a student joins the school, he is an analyst. And when he graduates, he's an analyst. So there's no concept of taxonomic learning, mastery learning. So there's learning actually happening, but the, the syllabus, the tests, the, the outcomes, they are just accreditation folders. They, they are a big room that are basically locked all throughout the year. And then just before accreditation, you open that room, you bring out those big folders and you stuff in some more papers there. This is what accreditation, and unfortunately, that's the reason why uh, we don't get the accuracy. In fact, this is the real way of doing it. You have to plug in outcomes and make sure that from 100, 200 courses, all the way to 400 courses, you have a progression in learning. I'm going to show you some practical examples. So you, you can take, uh, from applying, remembering, all the way you can take to creating, synthesizing. You can have this happening even in introductory courses. You can have creation happening in introductory courses. I had a very senior professor arguing with me, hey, you know, uh, explain, it's not uh, creating. Explain is basically understanding level of cognition, but explain could also be uh, basically effective domain especially if you're explaining uh, something with ethics, with some uh, uh, judgmental uh, and moral values, with uh, some of your own opinions, which you are trying to emphasize. There's an aspect of internalization there, characterization there. So it is no longer just cognitive. It becomes uh, actually effective domain. It can even be creative if you're explaining a totally new concept which you developed which you got patented, maybe you could be patenting something in the school or not, but the question is you could still have explained happening at the creative level. So the key thing is in introductory courses, you should have a majority of elementary skills and a few of the advanced skills. And let me show you the actually uh, uh, the chart that shows this uh, growth. Uh, I had it somewhere here. Yeah, this one. 
uh, if you look at this screen, you see the cognitive domain, affective domain, psychomotor domain. You find the six levels. So what we did to make it quantitatively measurable, accessible, uh, evaluatable, so we divided them into three levels, elementary, intermediate, advanced. And we put all the three domains there, you see. So knowledge and comprehension, they are mutually connected. So those which are mutually connected from a skill complexity aspect, we put them together. So you see valuing, if somebody takes a, a certain process or a certain system or uh, organizes something as per some standards, then he is having uh, some aspect of a valuing skill. And that would, could apply in the effective domain. So it totally depends how you characterize these outcomes and they have to be specific. You cannot, yes, you could have some generic outcomes like writing a report. You could have a generic outcome like uh, uh, making a presentation with some key aspects, but even the some of these generic outcomes could become specific depending on the product. Because writing a report for, uh, let's say a paper or writing a report for a magazine or writing uh, something else, a blog, uh, these could have different products and different scales of performances. So you actually uh, have to become specific. So I'm coming, there's a lot of examples for this, but time doesn't permit. But if you structure the skills in these three levels and in these three domains, you can capture them and you can see that progression happens. So in a course, when I start, let's say, doing course outcome one, I deal with some explain, I may deal with some, you know, uh, applying, then I go to course outcome three and four, and I go more towards the higher levels of learning. So each course outcome should feed into the other course. Outcome. There should be a mechanism for writing course. It should be sequential and progressive. But the way we write course outcome, and I come to that in the later phase of this presentation, is uh, kind of autonomous, independent. There's no connection between the various course outcomes and then they don't feed into each other. They are uh, treated independently. The practical is different. The theoretical is different, even though both practical and theoretical deal with one topic. So uh, let me go back here. And uh, if you look into this, uh, this is how you design curriculum. For an introductory course, you should have majority of elementary skills. That's, if you go back to that chart, you know what advanced skills are, you know what elementary skills are. Now, if you have an introductory course and you have a majority of advanced skills, that's a problem. Now, the question I have is, do accreditation agencies check for this? No, very rarely. So the reason why is uh, this is not even in the, you can say, chart for uh, the quality check. Yes, they have uh, regular outcomes. They have their indicators. but they also look at some rubrics, but they can't go lower than that. Uh, that's, this is a one missing gap in the system. And that's why outcomes are not uh, basically applying, integrating into education. They're just on the ledgers, they're reviewed. They're really not feeding the quality process. So the real way of doing it, national quality system, I'm coming to a, a image here. Uh, let me just show that to you. Uh, it's here, let, if I just move on and I'll come back again to the back uh, uh, over here. And this would be uh, very helpful for you. Let me just uh, see where that is. Yes, it's here. Okay, this is a way, way back. But, uh, I, I, will, I will come to that again. Uh, there is a slide coming up, but national qualification systems are three uh, interconnected uh, agencies. One is the national qualification frameworks, other is the national accreditation and national testing. So these are the three aspects of national qualification system. So if uh, you have any problem in this causal chain, you cannot get the result which you're looking into and that's one of the problems now we are just looking into courses I, I am coming from a higher up level i'm coming from national qualification framework level and then i will go into courses i will go into programs uh, so 
you see over here, once you have that flow from uh, introductory courses and advanced or uh, mastery courses, and then you have these different kinds of skills, the red, the red shaded area is an introductory course. You see a majority of the elementary skills are being covered. If you look at the greenish blue shaded area, that's a mastery level course. And you see majority of the mastery skills or the advanced skills uh, being covered over there. Now that's how your basic uh, structure of curriculum and course daily should work. So OBE is implemented using all of these different learning models. Some, some, some people, they start telling me, hey, uh, you have to compare OBE with problem-based learning. And thought, no, these are different learning models within the OB framework. The OB framework is the master framework that is adopted by all national qualification frameworks and accreditation agencies over the globe, especially the last uh, four or five years. It's been mandated all over the world. Now, to integrate the skills into education, there are four major aspects here. The four major aspects are learning model and then instructional strategy, quality improvement process, and digital technology. If you miss any one of these, it's not going to happen. You see, so today with the pandemic and a lot going on, and I've been in QS uh, you know, conferences and many of the conferences, all of the management administration are talking about hybrid systems of learning now. So we're not going to be purely lecture-based, we're going to have a hybrid system. So it's more demanding from us now as educators to look into what are the kind of uh, you know, uh, learning models we're going to implement in our schools. And these are connected with the structure of outcomes, with the uh, assessment processes, with the technology that we use, all of them will be connected. So here is an example of the European qualification framework. You have eight levels. The reason I'm going into the qualification framework is if you want the question that the professor asked, how can you connect all of these? Qualification framework, accreditation agency, testing. If there is a gap in the qualification framework, you cannot connect all of these three together. If the qualification framework is practical, it can be implemented, then you can connect them, you can implement them. But the problem now is if you look into these, these are so generic, they are so weak. And uh, you see, even if you want to go, there's no progression. How does one institution uh, or school prepare the students to go from one level to another level? There's no information here. There's no progression here. There's redundancy. There's a confusion now. There's knowledge, skills, responsibility, autonomy. Responsible autonomy, they call it competencies, actually. So there's a confusion here, knowledge, skills. So I'm going to go over the Vestera model and the Hussein model to explain to you the basic problem is understanding what are outcomes, what are skills, and what are competencies. If we understand them, then we will know, uh, you know how to write these qualification frameworks. And in fact, qualification frameworks like these are very simplistic uh, to extract uh, you know, uh, and uh, qualify qualifications and to produce learning outcomes from them as it is claimed that they are based on learning outcomes uh, information. So uh, unfortunately, uh, I'm not able to write learning outcomes with ac the accuracy. If you look over here, you look into the knowledge part, there's factual knowledge, there's conceptual knowledge. I will point out just some because I'm not here to uh, target any particular system, but I'm here just to point out a few issues. So the confusion is what are the learning domains? What should they be? Are the different kinds of uh, knowledge inclusive in each domain? Should they be inclusive in each domain? What are their factual knowledge, conceptual knowledge, metacognitive knowledge? You know, or, and and uh, should we basically introduce all of these uh, in all domains, or we should not? So. Let us clarify first what are outcome skills and competencies. Once outcome skills and competencies are clarified, we will be able to understand the big picture of the problem. Let's look into these beautiful definitions I picked up here. Outcomes can therefore be defined as a set of accessible, 
culminating demonstrations of knowledge, skills, and competencies gained following completion of their respective learning experiences at various levels of education, accurately aligned with appropriate learning out domains and learning levels, applied within specific contexts, and displaying clearly articulated and acceptable skill of performance. These are what outcomes are. Uh, this is very nice. Now, let's look at what skills are. Uh, according to Kirby, skills are more or less automated routines that allow the execution of well-specified tasks. Skills are the abilities to demonstrate learning activities in well-defined range of acceptable performances and complexities to complete tasks associated with specific or multiple learning domains, learning learning generic or given context. So skills are also outcomes. Outcomes is the umbrella. Skills are some acceptable performances that we define them that when, when the outcome has a certain acceptable performance in a certain domain at a certain learning level with a certain output and object, then it becomes a skill. Now, what is competence? The competence is the ability to perform with mastery in complex environments, transcending levels of knowledge and skills. Vestera studied the common definitions of competence and operational competence extracted its model. I will talk about that. The reason why it's very important is when you understand outcomes, skills, and competences, you can see the national qualification frameworks and see the domains and how appropriate they are. Uh, because if you cannot understand this, you cannot write the outcomes properly, you cannot structure them to assess them, and you will not get results, there will be no quality. So this is the conventional model. The conventional competency model, as stated by Vestera, is you have skills. But when you want about when you talk about competencies, you need to have additional mental competencies and other additional observational behaviors, other, other aspects beyond your skills to get competent behavior. So that is the conventional competency model. According to Vestera, competencies are need not be an additional aspect. They are skills. They are not requiring special conscious behavior. They don't require special mental aspects, no. They are, because there are many problems he stated with the conventional model. Assessment becomes problematic. Application becomes problematic. So with this particular model, which Vestera stated, many things are realizable practically. So competencies are actually skills. They're in fact skills. So competencies, in fact, uh, uh, they are uh, mastery of some skills. There are some clear performance indicators of what uh, you know, uh, performers are supposed to demonstrate. So now if you look into this, uh, this is purely in the cognitive domain. Now this is the Hussein model, which we developed. If you look over here, this is talking about all kinds of knowledge, factual knowledge, conceptual. We see knowledge cannot be, if a person has a cognitive skill, it means he has knowledge of that. You don't try to separate knowledge in the national collection framework. I think this is a big error. You try to put cognitive skill, you try to put psychomotor skill and affected domain skills. That's it. You don't need to separate knowledge because if you separate knowledge, the only way you can test knowledge is through the skill, cognitive skill. The why do you separate it? And the problem becomes in the national collection framework. You don't know where the psychomotor is and we don't know what cognitive is. They have to try to explain that, which becomes a challenge. And I'll give you some example. I could spend two, three hours just talking on the national collection framework. But I don't want to overburden you. I went over some theory with you just to talk about the problem. The stem of the problem is the national qualification framework. If the national qualification framework is properly designed, that it can be implemented into assessment, implemented by specializations. One more thing, which is a very big problem, is the national qualification framework cannot be generalized across all specializations. You cannot possibly generalize a certain level, level 8 or level 10. Uh, engineering and law or humanities or uh, medicine, you cannot do that. There are very specific learnings, levels, progression, which are defined for each specialization. So this is a key thing that we have to remember. That is one of the problems why the, uh, the existential gap between uh, frameworks and policies and industry, because those are not being connected by uh, 
the process in the accreditation agencies. Now, if you look here in this model, we're talking about all three domains going from lower level and all our skills, all our skills. Yes, now the highest skill is a competency. All of these are outcomes. All of these are outcomes. You see, competency is the outcome, skill is the outcome, outcome is the outcome. All of them are outcomes. But when you go to a certain level of a prescription or definition of performance, then it becomes a competency. Uh, I, I hope it's uh, clear. So this is a very important uh, table. There's a Vestera model 2001 and Ocean model that was done 2020. What are the similarities? Competencies are subcategory of skills. We agree. Both skills and competence consist of cognitive structure. Yes, we agree. Competencies and our skills applied in specific context and condition. We agree. Competencies are assessed with a range of standards. We agree. Now, which is the differentiating point between what I believe and what Vestera does? Competencies are higher order skills. I say no. Competencies can be higher or low order skills. It doesn't have to be higher order all the time. Competencies are subcategory. It's, it's your definition. It's you, how you define it. Because uh, it depends on the job role. It depends on the task. It depends on the course. So uh, you don't necessarily have to have a competency at the end of uh, the curriculum. So attitudes are inputs to develop skills and competencies. Attitudes, behaviors, values are all skills and they can also be competencies. We are not saying that they're inputs. We are saying they can also be competencies. They can also be skills. Now, knowledge is a fundamental input to develop skills and competencies. What we say, appropriate content and complexity of factual, conceptual, procedural, and metaconic knowledge, all are required. They are fundamental components. This is very, very important for people who are designing national collection frameworks, including the EQF. So you have to integrate all the four aspects. Even a kindergarten should have magnetic metacognitive. What they did, oh, only level eight upwards should have metacognitive. I'll show you the data for that. So no, all of them should have metacognitive. All of them should have procedural. All of them should have factual and conceptual. All of these domains of knowledge, competence, knowledge should be there in all the levels. If you don't have that, then you cannot get a learning progression. You cannot connect the dots. You cannot just turn on metacognition. You cannot do that. The learning progression is not indicated for development of skills. Learning progression is crucial and key aspect of each domain. This is very, very crucial. That's the reason why we don't achieve quality because it's all ad hoc, ad hoc Brownian movement. You know, it's plug and play, it's reverse engineering. Knowledge is a reproduction, uh, is not classified as a skill. Reproduction of all, all types of knowledge is fundamental component of all skills. And For even the psychomotor, you have to have procedural knowledge. For the effective domain, you have to have knowledge of values and ethics, responsibility. You need to have a value, knowledge of the school. So knowledge is everywhere. So it is when you have the skill, you have knowledge. You cannot uh, separate this. So uh, then you have assessment. Uh, over here, assessment assumes Competences are applied in defined context and conditions. Assessment should estimate to some level of approximation range of standards of performance in undefined context and conditions. Assessment details are not specified. Assessment model includes the use of specific PIs and so when you talk about competence, you have to have the assessment for that. Without assessment, you cannot talk of competencies. It is incorrect because it is un OBE. So uh, what we design is the learning domains wheel. And uh, the reason why I, I talk about this is uh, uh, we had uh, some uh, you know, qualification framework uh, like this. It had uh, five domains, knowledge, cognitive skills, uh, psychomotor, and uh, it had uh, the uh, communication, information technology, interpersonal skills. Later on, it was shifted to knowledge, skills, competence. This is national qualification framework. And we were, uh, I was also a proponent always talking because you see over here, uh, knowledge uh, and cognitive skills. There's a lot of overlap here. Psychomotor and communication information, tech, numerical, there's a lot of overlap. Numerical and knowledge, there's a lot of overlap. Uh, interpersonal skills and cognitive, there's a lot of overlap. 
so uh, that becomes very problematic and that's why we use Venn diagrams, we call it learning domains wheel. In the Venn diagram learning domains wheel, we basically draw the domains of any national collection, we draw them, and then we put the key points of each learning domain and we see whether there's an overlap. If there is a major overlap, like for example, the country says, okay, we want to have a teamwork and we want to have leadership. So we tell the country, please either use leadership or use teamwork, don't use both. Because leadership is a subset of teamwork. So teamwork is a superset. Try to use a supersets for your domains. The reason is they don't think from a perspective of assessment. From a perspective of assessment, accreditation and quality, measurement, teaching, pedagogy, you cannot have, uh, like you, you see over here in this particular chart, numeric skills is in the heart of all psychomotor, effective, problem solving, knowledge. Everything is numeric skills. Is, is included there. So now when we ask programs to do assessment and mark the outcomes with the classification, they start dumping here and here and here and here and here and here. It becomes a nightmare for documentation. And it creates so much redundancy when you start uh, measuring whether the numeric skills are there, you will have a lot of redundant assessment. First of all, the assessment doesn't happen accurately. So this is a, a problem. Uh, and so that's the reason why the qualification framework shifted to this one. Uh, I'm not saying this new one has its own problem. It has its own problems as well. Now, another thing I want to point out is lifelong learning skills. According to McGurra's great work, lifelong learning skills, it is self-management, self-regulation, mindset, motivation, all that. It is also problem solving. Problem solving is also an aspect of lifelong learning. Critical thinking, student thinking, this is an aspect of lifelong learning. If you have that, you have lifelong learning. And then social interaction, social values, creativity, teamwork. If you have these three aspects, you can do lifelong. But now some countries, what they do, they select lifelong learning and problem solving. Try to select the superset. Because for lifelong learning, you have to measure problem solving. Now you will create a redundancy. For assessment perspective, it is creating redundancy when you put lifelong and problem solving together. So you have to understand each uh, domain and its superset. Is it a superset not? Is it a subset? Are they overlapping too much? Is there too much redundancy? If there's too much redundancy, it will create problems for assessment. So this is again, lifelong learning and it is three aspects and where those three aspects can be measured. So uh, I want to point out one other great aspect of uh, accreditation agency, like the Washington Accord. This is an absolute wonderful job and a huge element of transformation over here. You see, they clearly specified with detail, problem solving. What is the range of problems? Look at that, wonderful. Range of conflicting requirements. And they spell it out for the technologist, for the engineer, for the technician. They basically specified all of those uh, levels of what the range of problem solving should be. And this is structured. Now it is getting structured. You need to incorporate that. Now my question is, if you just take one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight aspects of problem solving, eight aspects of problem solving, and they are still generic. Can you live with five performance indicators for problem solving? This is the Washington Accord, ABET, NBA, uh, I think BAT in Bangladesh, everybody have to follow this. They have to follow that. So how can you have a few five or six or 10 performance indicators to capture all of that. You can't, you cannot do that. So that, that's a joke, that becomes a joke. So you look the same over here, range of engineering activities. What we're talking about real life complex problems. This is a very good, uh, you know, array of uh, complexity of real life problems that they have provided. So this is very helpful. But the question is how many of our programs even open this and incorporate this into which course and where can I get this to happen? Where can I involve the use of diverse resources? There is, when we make our curriculum a teacher, we don't even refer to this. So this is a guideline. I'm going to come to how to use these resources to develop curriculum. This is also a guide for accreditation that the accreditation is also have to check this. They have to check uh, emerging skills and skills from the industry. And they have to check the profile. These profiles should be relevant. They should be relevant with what the industry wants. They actually come from the global societies. 
but you have to integrate them and you have to integrate the industry requirement into curriculum and accreditation is you check that and that should come from the national collection framework the national collection framework should integrate the emerging skills and the requirements of society at large but it is doesn't specify that it's too generic and vague in fact if you want to really make a benefit of national collection framework you should have a framework for each specialization to the detail it's a lot of work but without that unfortunately you cannot implement them you cannot that's why you see uh, accreditation agencies uh, not able to implement the collection frameworks and even check them correctly all they do is look at the form are the domains covered are they mapped that's done done daily so you see graduate uh, profiles all the program outcomes for engineering come from them the same i think goes to all the other specializations so uh, you see all of them so these cannot be you know measured in a handful of outcomes they cannot be done so you have to have the cumulative outcomes you have to have the uh, outcomes that help develop the cumulative outcomes and then you have to have the discrete or you have to have at least the three level structure of outcomes you need to have that and uh, you cannot have generic outcomes to measure higher specialization it becomes extremely difficult look at the competency profiles uh, see legal regulatory ethics this is all affected domain this is all affected domain people say we don't have we have affected domain and we need to integrate it. this is not content this is the application of content this is the context that dr sperry was talking about so this is a great job that they did so this is a practical example how you can implement it number one you identify key skills like lifelong learning or any other skill you take it from the world economic forum report the world economic forum report by country they give you what are the top skills what are the future of skills what are the top jobs so you can match with your particular specialization and you can write them down then you can overlap them which is step 2 with the quality agency attributes overlap them don't repeat the work overlap refine them and then the step 3 is you design the curriculum so i give an example here this is a curriculum this are the program outcomes on the top you see the courses then you uh, get a introductory course then you get a reinforced course then you get a mastery course you see the three levels electronics one power system one and the capstone and then you plug in i okay i want to talk about let's say this particular job uh, solar panel installations or some design or whatever those are so where can i do this where can i do that where can i do this so it has to plug but unfortunately it's ad hoc is not interconnected the outcomes uh, every teacher does his own outcomes there's no program level discussion there's no uh, you know uh, cross checking or feedback from prerequisite course teachers to the other teachers and how one can define another outcome that feeds into another so that process doesn't exist you see so this is a nice and simple chart that indicates how you take from the industry you connect with the quality profiles and then you integrate into curriculum you, de you de develop the curriculum that way the delivery of the curriculum so uh, that way then you have the mountain climber model the whole curriculum is there you cover all the type of skills you have designed down and then uh, you have the different levels of courses so you achieve a comprehensive delivery uh, all that uh, being said uh, is this is the ideal model Uh, but you see in reality uh, it's not really happening now this is from uh, uh, sedef uh, and they themselves if you look at these curves here this is the eqf showing the eight levels and you see the green curve is the metacognitive knowledge so the metacognitive knowledge starts happening from the sixth level if you see you see the curve it's entering into uh, actually uh, metacognitive is in the seventh and eighth level there's no metacognitive knowledge before that which is not correct you should have metacognitive knowledge uh, right from the start so this is uh, one then you see some progressions like malta uh, they are uh, doing something about uh, progression there is a progression in their collection framework so most of the collection framework they are generic vague they just give one statement there's no progression you don't know how one level will progress to another there's no interrelation it's suddenly there so uh, that's another issue now just examining one of these you see redundancy you see skills skills there's knowledge and there's skills knowledge also has skills if you really look in them if you look into the westera and our model and you look at this there is a confusion here where are the skills where are the competencies you know and then uh, why are you separating them this way 
you rather separate them according to domain cognitive psychomotor and effective that would be better but if you say because uh, you see even the skills they can be of a competence they can be competence there they can be competence in and, and knowledge they have just concentrated on theoretical factual knowledge so there, there are some problems here you know and uh, some of these are too high standard if you look like the, you, you want students to make invention this is level 10 but it's it's really uh, too autonomous and uh, too high standard so uh, this becomes actually difficult to implement you cannot come back to implement curriculum and they say in in the coalition framework they say curriculum will be developed from it learning outcomes will be developed from it but how can you do it you can't so uh, these are the key takeaways from our work and should list all major sectors and specializations informal formal available to learners and applicable to the needs and configuration of a dynamic national economy that's point number one the scope of framework should not be comprehensive of all learning achievement and pathways but should be adequately structured and accurately aligned to a particular sector and specialization for ease of implementation and alignment the domains and their level descriptors should incorporate the needs and emerging skills of the labor market while observing rules for minimal mapping redundancy as prescribed by the learning domain wheel. So the redundancy, you have to take into account the redundancy. Otherwise, you'll have a fiasco when you go for assessment. The set of criteria should not be implicit, but rather explicit in a hierarchical structure showing vertical progression in learning built up with a set of level descriptors for each domain as levels. Of, so this is missing in the question framework, all of them. Each level of collection should be further structured into its levels of learning to enable ease of implementation of learning progression by institutions and programs and facilitate their credible quality assurance and accurate evaluation by accreditation agencies. So that's one of the reasons the accreditation agencies are not able to take the collection from and see. They just see the form. Okay, they see this domain, check, check, check. Okay, it's done. But where's the quality? You can't uh, track quality. You cannot implement quality with this. The domains, levels, and details of level discourse should be categorized accurately for each listed sector and specialization, enabling development of very reliable national regional assessments and testing. For So it should be incorporated by national testing. Now I have a question here. Any of the national testing uh, tests for the national qualification frameworks? And is there a mapping? This is a golden question. Uh, it, it's not there. So uh, looking at uh, accreditation, now you have some basic elements of accreditation this is a uh, common among uh, most of the accreditation agencies uh, if you look here students enrollment graduation ad advising program objectives goals program outcomes you have uh, the curriculum you have uh, the uh, the continuous quality improvement infrastructure faculty community service and research these are the standards of accreditation criteria all over the globe and everybody knows about them uh, now i have listed this in the table each of these you can align to the national collection framework i'm not going to go over them but i am showing you how they can be aligned for example program objectives and goals look at the live performance roles national goals professional societies organizations regional and international job market skills requirements program outcomes professional societies, international QA agencies, you see, and uh, regional international job market skills, international reports, you can get uh, the alignment and you can get input from each of these. Now curriculum as well. So national collection frameworks and national data and international you know, job market requirements have a very key role to play in all of this. So if they're not integrated and not defined properly, that is the crux of the problem. Uh, there, there are many other things here, like if you look at uh, quality management, quality standards, quality monitoring, quality control, quality cycles, I'll come to that, quality cycles sometimes don't exist properly. They're not practical, they're not realistic. I'll give you examples of those. Uh, program evaluation, they're very spurious, sporadic, picking up outcomes here and there picking up assessments here and there. And the justification is it is summative. It's enough to measure the program. When you do that, outcomes are not measured for any student. All students never have outcomes measured. Uh, you could say maybe 
uh, 1% of the students, uh, if they go into the accreditation room, they can pick up their outcomes and look at that data. But you cannot say that the other 99% can look at all their outcomes. The students don't have that access. That's why you need embedded assessment, especially uh, John Estelle's FCAR is a good solution if it can be digitized then you can track with the performance vector table you can track every student's hundreds of outcomes can be tracked so you see uh, course evaluations again they have to be widespread outcomes uh, heterogeneous samples uh, weighted assessment final and quiz is the same level then you have midterm and capstone same level then you have applying and creating same level then you do evaluating and understanding same level you put all tomatoes potatoes uh, chocolates everything uh, and a fruit salad and uh, call it a fruit salad it's not a fruit salad potatoes are potatoes and fruits are fruits and chocolate is chocolate you got to separate them you cannot separate them in paper on paper in excel you can't do that it's too difficult that's why you don't get that accuracy now uh, there is a lot of more detail uh, over here uh, this is uh, the ABIT model, and you see the outcomes. It is clearly ABIT uh, information, Glorologist model. And you see each outcome is sampled. So two outcomes are sampled 2004, 2005. Two outcomes are sampled 2005, 2006. Two outcomes 2007, 2007. And then again, the cycle goes. So every two, three, four years, it may take about six, seven, eight, ten 10 years, depending on the program, to measure all the outcomes. To measure all of them so that's why uh, from a quality cycle perspective they make sure that quality cycle perspective that's too long it's not student centered it's and uh, this is the, this is the process for all of the accreditation agencies you see now these are uh, the quality processes they also spread over multiple years so many years so the reason is the cycle has to be you know uh, manageable and focus on the student so that yes there will be some program level corrections institutional corrections that may take longer but there are a bunch of uh, student uh, you know failures that need remediation real time while the student is existing in the process that's obe and that's kind of uh, kind of gets uh, missing so we have uh, cycles of assessment which are uh, quite lengthy uh, but schools are implementing other ways too. Uh, I'm not saying this is the ABIT model. This is just the Gloria Roger model. And, and ABIT uh, actually uh, is basically, uh, you could say, uh, the catalyst for OB to be implemented in several decades and has uh, done a more enormous and a great job for that. But a certain model, which is used by many schools, it, uh, it's accepted for accreditation. And it takes the CQI over a large number of years. And so uh, the student uh, cohorts are never considered here. It's program centered, becomes program centered. So you see here, data collection goes over such a long period of time because it's actually manual. When you go manual, you have to do this. You have to go through a process like this. If it's uh, automated, you can make it faster. Automated the right way using embedded assessments you can do it faster so you see here there's program education objectives the program outcome the specific performance indicators the course outcomes each has a cycle of its own so we have developed this uh, six cycles now the q1 is developing the course outcomes developing uh, the rubrics uh, and 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 uh, developing the curriculum delivery of the course that's q1 then if you go to Q2, it's the course delivery over the course uh, term, this, the semester. So you have a syllabus phase, then you have a midterm quiz and some exams done, then you have a final done, then you have some projects. So we have audits and checklists for each phase throughout the semester. We make sure that's another quality cycle. So it has a different time frame and different checkpoints uh, to make sure the PDCA cycle that we are on track quality assurance. Now, if you look at Q3, Q3 is the program review. You collect all the program outcomes and then review them. And you look at the course outcomes, the course actions, and you make sure everything is implemented correctly. That's Q3 and you generate some actions and it goes from there. And then if you look at Q4, Q4 is the performance indicators. You don't leave them alone. You review, are they relevant? Are they measurable? 
Are they producing data that can be benchmarked? Are they of any use? So Q4 is the PI review in three years. So there are some absolute student-centered uh, action that take place within the semester, within the course of students education, and there are some which are program level. So I'm not denying that there's no course level uh, or program level, like the, both of them exist, but the focus should be on student-centered correction. Now, if you look at uh, Q5 over here, you're looking at uh, multi-term. You take the multi-term data and then you do a review for that. You you look at six years and you look at look do benchmarking. You look at the program outcomes or you look at the course outcomes and you can track that. You can never track that uh, I mean, manually. Yes, you can, but it's just a huge amount of information, a sea of information. Especially if you have like ten thousand students in any program, how can you aggregate that? How can you follow up on that? Uh, things start becoming very uh, obscure and problematic. So, but we can do that with the right kind of technology and the right approach. We can definitely achieve that. Uh, another thing is uh, all of these outcomes are measured using generic rubrics and they're applied by independent creators who are not part of the course and they do check marks like this and that becomes a problem as well. This is all manual mechanism. So uh, we published a paper, I would ask you to refer to that, just type EBIT activation, my name, and you look at the conceptual frameworks the uh, the uh, theoretical frameworks, the practical frameworks to have a very comprehensive perspective of how you know we can uh, deal with this issue of implementing uh, you know the right uh, practical uh, aspects of uh, you can say uh, uh, quality systems. Uh, there are four major parts of this: learning management systems, outcomes assessment systems, continuous improvement management systems and academic advising. We need academic advising also based on outcomes. So uh, just learning management is not enough. You need to have outcomes assessment systems, and then you need to have a continuous improvement management system that links the result of accurate outcomes data to different committees. And you have a tracking way mechanism for actions, digital ID of an action that you can track, is it closed? Is it a high priority action? and who closed it, what was the result, what is the objective evidence of the closure. So everything is there electronically and committees communicate with each other based on evaluation results. The moment you have a program review, boom, you send the action to let's say the strategic planning committee or the curriculum committee, the civil engineering course doesn't do location of columns. So we have to introduce this in the prerequisite course because reinforced concrete design does not uh, have that skill in students. So uh, it's missing in the engineering uh, or civil drawing course. So that's basically a, a, an action from the program review. You extract it, electronically send it to uh, the uh, curriculum development uh, committee, and then they make the change in the curriculum and assign uh, the changes to uh, the course uh, portfolio. So you have a combination all of all of this. You put them together, and you can implement uh, the right practice, uh, the right technology, and try to achieve some level of uh, you know, accuracy. Uh, uh, so, uh, Dr. Server, uh, I'm going to take a little pause, take a few questions at this point. Uh, there's a lot of practical examples uh, here about like how to make course outcomes, the language of outcomes. Uh, I've just been able to cover some aspects of national collection frameworks uh, and some aspects of uh, technology. Uh, what, uh, based on the needs of the audience and the questions, I can address uh, more specific aspects with the slides, but I think at this point, uh, I will open the floor to questions and based on the question, I'll open the slides, the, the coming up slide, there's some more slides because of time constraint. Okay, uh, thank you, Professor Vajit. Uh, there's a huge uh, lot of uh, uh, material we have already presented. So there's a question from Adrian uh, Camarins, uh, North, uh, North State College. Uh, he's asking is, there is a misconception in the application of OBE in the curriculum. What the faculty in higher education institutions should bear in mind in designing lesson aligned to OBE rather than the outcomes-based accreditation? Yes, you have to develop a structure. Take it from the program outcomes take it to the course outcomes and under the course outcomes, you put the performance indicators. 
when you do that you will not have uh, the problem and i will show you the actual example for this this is a uh, problems in many of us don't know how to write outcomes so there are some notes here i will not be able to cover that this itself takes a couple of hours uh, you know uh, what is uh, outcomes how to write the right outcomes L let me just show you by example uh, yeah this one y you see this is the course outcome uh, you're able to see that correct so uh, what we do when we write course outcome we sit with the faculty and we understand what is the scope of the course we look at the lecture we look at the syllabus it has lecture topics correct and it has the weeks so we tell the faculty to tell us that what are the major demonstrable activities for each topic or each time period let's say if he is talking about two weeks i would put it as one activity in a course outcome one topic or two topics i may join it as one course outcome uh, if you look over here for example analyze the steady state performance of basic single phase transformers this is analysis that the teacher wants to focus on he doesn't want to focus on explain doesn't want to focus on evaluate just analyze this now this particular course outcome is still broad and generic we will break it down into more uh, activity using performance indicators when you have this structure you can get the accuracy and each performance indicator will be linked to the program outcome if it's problem solving linked to problem solving if it's communication linked to communication if it's uh, let's say uh, critical thinking it will link to critical thinking whatever is the program you have to make that linking mapping but uh, once again this is a uh, uh, doable in excel but it will be very difficult now if you look at this particular course outcome chart i am going topic by topic it is not ad hoc topic by topic and exactly what is the professor targeting in that topic and if you see here there is the course outcome number three describe the construction and operation of asynchronous motor generator and verify in lab experiment so uh, if we are talking about the topic of asynchronous motors what does uh, the faculty want to do he wants to describe some of these features and he wants to verify their operation in lab experiment. So both of them are covered in one course outcome. This is called a com compound course outcome. The verbs are highlighted, but you would need actually the uh, performance indicators to measure them. Now, this is an example I'm giving here. Uh, this is more detailed, but because of time, I'm not able to, but this is an example. This is a professor who wrote this particular uh, outcome understand evolution of wireless communication system and also understand and compare this was the original outcome when i sat with him i found out that he just wants to define because understand is not measurable you cannot measure understanding you have to convert it to demonstrable verbs so define basic terms this was done so if you look at define if you look at the performance indicators define is cognitive understanding cognitive domain understanding level then the performance indicator is detailed detailed so that you create assessment you create rubric you can make a rubric out of the performance indicator define basic term to describe elements of wireless communication system, such as types of station blah 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 it's a specific detail okay now if you look at the second part of the course outcome elaborate on their evolution now elaborating on their evolution is a basic in effective domain because you're going to compare look at look at pi so8 performance indicator so so8 is basic so1 is problem solving so8 is the knowledge and impact of engineering solutions so this is effective domain because you're looking into impact from a global economic environmental societal context so it's not cognitive anymore it is effective everything is cognitive but it is effective predominantly effective domain because you're looking into the internalized state or the valuing state of the effective domain this skill application of the student so they are using that to create that so i made this performance indicator and we made that we changed the outcome the last was compare existing uh, common mobile communication system this comparison we again we all we do we ask the faculty what kind of what are you doing you are comparing the hardware the cost the character complexity so this is basically a cognitive evaluation evaluation is judgment analysis is breaking down into components and then seeing how they can work applying basic theory to solve problems evaluating you make a judgment call in then you compare you give a class a class b a 400 dollar 500 dollar or fail or pass so uh, it is very important to classify them when you do that 
then you can implement uh, assessment and you have to track all of this. And we actually track that. Uh, and I'll, I'll show you the example. What I'm doing is actually all done. You see a question. So the COPI, everything is tracked and is tracked electronically. Uh, this is the type of uh, outcomes here. Uh, you see, uh, let me go back. Actually, uh, there was a uh, sheet way up uh, in the back, but it'll take me a long time to go there. Uh, so I think I have answered you. There's a digital database of uh, we have hundreds of performance indicators and we classify them according to each outcome. Uh, this SO1 is the program outcome. The PI is the PI number. The SO is the program. Outcome. So the PI is measured in the course, but it directly relates to the program outcome. I hope I answered you. Dr. Server, there's another question. Yes, thank you. Uh, yes, uh, there's one more question uh, from uh, Mr. Abu Yusuf, uh, Department of Chemical Engineering and Polymer Science, Shahjar University of Science and Technology. Uh, his question is how to evaluate the achievement of POs of different courses, what tools we can use? Okay. For example, if you are looking at teamwork, correct? For teamwork, you have to create assessment instrument. If you're looking at communication, you have to create the assessment instrument. If you're looking at, uh, let's say, writing skills, you have to create the assessment instrument. When I say assessment instrument, you have to take down the aspects of teamwork, like role playing, listening to your peers, completing your actions, developing a team contract, scheduling your actions, you have to make those indicators for each program outcome. However, these examples I have given you are generic ones. And then you make the rubric for that. Do you understand my point? Then you can apply them in courses and measure them. However, if it is a problem solving, now, like I mentioned to you, if it's an electromagnetic theory course and if it's a digital logic course, the problem solving can be, again, very, very different. The problem solving, for example, you're trying to locate a charge in a space or you're trying to locate charge next to some potential. The formula, the theory, the procedure is very specific. Now, if you're trying to simplify digital logic circuits using Carnot map theory and Boolean algebra, the knowledge for that, the procedure for that, the result for that is very specific. So you have to make very specific uh, you know, performance indicators and rubrics and implement it. Now you see the example over here. We have a rubric here. This is, uh, what is this? I'm going to just show you. This is, uh, I think, uh, if I'm not wrong, draw the stress transformation for plain stress condition mechanical problem using more circle. So we wrote hundreds of rubrics. So we wrote over here, 10% extract the correct orientation, 15% mark the graph paper, 50% draw the accurate point of graph, draw more circle, 25%. And this one, we actually separated it to different parts of the question and we also graded it that way. So there is a reliability, there is validity, there is a structure. So if you have to write outcomes, you have to write it uh, from the program, you take it the course, course systematic, topic by topic, Six weeks, the course uh, outcome can be compounded, many activities. If it's a two weeks course outcome, it will be just one verb. So if it is uh, more time, then of course it'll, it'll divide into multiple uh, course outcomes. So you have to make it progressive. And then you have to write the performance and, and you have to write the rubric. That's the right way of doing it. Not for every trivial problem, but all the major problems of your course, you have to have a rubric. Without that, you cannot assess them in the courses. So you have to have that mapping. It has to be done very scientifically and technically. Uh, there are more examples, uh, very specific, I can show, but I have to glance over my slides uh, and it may take a little bit of time. Uh, uh, Dr. Silver, uh, next question. Sure. Uh, our next question is from Dr. Rajiv Lochandash from IUBAT. Uh, could you please tell about quality culture of institution? How does it influence the quality management of education? There is no culture uh, in uh, institutions as it is. The culture is created by establishing a climate of quality. The climate of the quality, because we have been doing for a very, very long time, heavy, heavy accreditation, I'm telling you this thing. Please take a pen and paper and note it down. The climate of quality will be established by establishing the quality processes. If you do not establish quality processes, which is quality management, quality control, quality monitoring, quality assurance, all the process, I told you the five, six 
quality cycle, the processes, the timing, the technology, the people. If you don't specify it, there is no quality culture. Quality culture doesn't come just like that. It's the most difficult thing. It's the most hated thing. People want quality, but the culture doesn't come like that. It's the most difficult job, quality and accreditation. And to implement that, you have to create a culture by the process. The process will create a bureaucracy of uh, making this a spontaneous output. The culture will come. That's what we did. When we started, there was a lot of resistance. But after some time, people understood that it was very automatic, very spontaneous. And they were feeling relaxed, actually. Then the division of work also started happening. Automation started plugging in. So then, you know, the other values of improvements start kicking in. Uh, Dr. Server. Yes. Uh, next question comes from uh, Professor Adrian again. Uh, he's uh, asking is there is a notion that define should not be used as ILO under OBE. Any thoughts? Do you have no, any no, thoughts? There, there, is, there is nothing like that. It all depends on your level of learning activity and the importance. I, I just showed you, uh, like I think a, a few slides ago, uh, that we had defined and we used it. And it is used in an elective course. And you see, I'll come back here now. You see here, define basic terms. And this is elective course because this is a wireless communication. It was an elective course. And here we're defining terms. Define can also be used in a very senior level uh, you know, courses. So it all depends on the context and the application. You could define your own rules. You could define your own process and code. There's nothing. This is all misconception. You can have even very basic uh, language in uh, learning outcomes or you can have the most advanced the key thing is alignment if you're not aligned like this your whole process will be defective the end results will be just numbers plugged into excel or charts there's no application to quality they're just numbers that's it the people accreditation will come they take a look okay the numbers are there even they cannot in two three days or in a month of review they cannot track down because the collection frameworks and the connection, the policies, the processes are not interconnected. So uh, we cannot trace back and see where the problem is. If everything was interconnected, then the final result, let's say the language of outcomes was correct. Let's say rubrics were mandatory. Let's say they were supposed to be specific. Let's say all the students were being measured. Let's say all the courses, all everything was tracked down. Then the number and the aggregation was weighted, not tomatoes, potatoes, everything together. Then when you have a number, it makes sense. When you don't have all these things checked and not required, accreditation sometimes says you don't to sample all, you don't need to sample, you just sample random, randomly. But random is totally against OB. That doesn't give data to every student. And just a transcript is not going to help the student. Dr. Server. Okay. Uh, I think this will be the last questions of today. Uh, this is from, oh. Another question has arrived. Uh, this is from uh, Muhammad Hamidur Rahman, uh, Bangladesh in Army University of Engineering and Technology. Uh, his question is, all the rubrics and the constraints by limiting COs and the like, are we not forcing our learners to focus more on instructional pressure? I'm trying to understand the question. Uh, uh, all the rubrics and the constraints by limiting COs. That means... Uh, uh, okay, I, I understood. The problem here is the way you write the COs. If your COs are not covering the full com comprehensiveness of the course and they do not reflect real learning, yes, they will be heavily constraining your uh, assessment, the student performance, the biggest problem is uh, we don't sit down. We Usually when we uh, develop a course, it takes two days, two days to write the outcome. I have uh, approximately eight to 16 hour sessions and faculty sweat because we sit down, we bring all the assessments, we bring the textbook, we have an interview with the faculty. That's the job of outcome assessment specialists. In the US, it's a very big job now, how to assess outcomes and outcome specialist they will work with each faculty they will make sure that what outcome you write is actually what is happening and what you want to target 
I'll give you an example. We had a renewable energy course. The faculty member, he wrote the outcome and this outcome was uh, basically evaluate uh, various renewable energy systems and their processes and this and something like that. When I sat down with the faculty and we reviewed it in more detail, uh, what we found out is uh, it's basically economic characteristics, economic characteristics of various system subsystems of, uh, there was no evaluation. It was purely analysis. We fixed that. So we fixed the language. Of the, so you see, sometimes we have uh, very seasoned uh, teachers, but when it comes to writing outcomes, uh, it is not having alignment. And, and some of the accreditation evaluators, they're very good. When they come, they find out one of the biggest problems of uh, schools which get accredited by good agencies and good developers are alignment. So I see over here, the problem you have is the outcomes are not uh, reflecting the true scale, the true kinds of activities. And uh, uh, that is why they're severely restricting by your, I think, limiting, very limiting rubrics, what actually happens. That's what's happening. Thank you. Uh, there is one more question. Uh, it is uh, from Professor Dr. Mutahar Islam from United International University. His question is, uh, university teachers often claims that OB activities weaken the research and innovation. What do you think? Because it takes a lot of time of theirs. Yes, now, one of the problems is uh, overburdening. Uh, if teach, this is administrative and uh, I think uh, a logistic problem. If you overburden a teacher with let's say six courses and then a large number of students, and then he has to produce research. And on top of that, he has to change his teaching strategy. On top of that, he has to do outcomes work. Yes, anything works with logistics. Even if you take medication, there is a dosage for that. If you overdo it, you will kill yourself. So OBE, it works in a certain environment with a certain logistics, with a certain ratio of student faculty, with a certain amount of work at your hands and without technology, you cannot do it. Uh, this is the key thing, the right kind of technology because some technology is just there, it's the same thing, plug in, plug in the errors. So technology doesn't help you streamline, technology doesn't help you be accurate. So this is a very big problem. So uh, I think uh, if you have to discuss with, with uh, administration, look into the whole, actually ABIT has a good uh, calculation. It has a table where you calculate faculty student ratio, calculate number of courses and they review that. So uh, generally uh, schools, they plug in numbers and try to make a good number come up at the end. But in the reality, this is a compound, complex, and uh, problem that many schools, especially I think in our part uh, of the world, uh, developing countries, they're overloaded and lack of technology and too many students. And that's why it's just spilling over now. In Thank fact, uh, in fact, uh, ABIT, ABIT, they say your re research should reinforce your teaching skill. Uh, ABIT, when they visit you, they make sure that your research matches your teaching. Any research you do, uh, which is not related to your teaching, isn't uh, uh, really going to help you. So if you are current with the research, current with industry, and it's helping you teach the latest, the best way of teaching and representing information to your students, then that is uh, very regarded by ABIT. So just to point out uh, about research and uh, OBE. Thank you, Professor Wajid. I think uh, yeah, we have uh, we have considered all the questionnaires so far found in the um, our uh, question and uh, response system. And uh, if there are no more questions, and uh, Professor Wajid, if you have anything else to show you can or else we can close it today yeah i will just uh, conclude uh, with this because there is a lot of content usually uh, sometimes we take hours uh, not mm -hmm. lesser and uh, with the direct interaction with faculty there are tons and tons of aspects here so uh, bottom line is uh, uh, there is there are frameworks 
there are essential paradigm and principles and uh, they have to be implemented in the major national organized policy uh, starting from national question frameworks and their detail is very important and if accreditation implements that then it is uh, practically implementable by you know programs and you start seeing results integrating even the global required skills into curriculum making curriculum dynamic is very important all of that is a transformational ob and with that uh, you're free to contact info ob uh, and also a great summit coming up and a sequel of webinars which are going to address many other aspects we'll try to have another webinar another a uh, program where we can get into details of course evaluation that could itself take a few hours uh, all right uh, dr sever thank you and thank you to everybody for uh, their patience and uh, for being with us today and we apologize and and you can send your questions on the uh, i think the google form and your uh, presence for the professional development hours on another uh, button there and you can just put your information and 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 uh, we will send out the pd e certificates to you in some time thank you thank you professor azid and thank all to, uh, all the audiences